Today I'm gonna to show you guys how I recreated the track Mona Lisa, Mona Lisa by Phineas. I haven't looked at Phineas yet on the channel. I really love his production style. Actually, the first time I ever listened to his album, The Optimist, three songs in, I bought the record on vinyl, so I'm really excited to jump into it. We're gonna be taking a look at how he gets his super grungy guitar tone, his really interesting choices of synthesizers, how he gets such a distorted mix all the time, and a lot more. But before we jump into all that, let me introduce myself. Hi, my name is Seth. I produce music under the name Velvet Year. I do one of these videos every Friday to show people how to produce their own pop music at home. Songs have either written or produced have been featured on these Spotify curated playlists, and I did an entire album through Warner Music Group. So if you enjoy this video and think that we would have fun working on a project together, check out the top link in my description. Now onto the rest of it. First thing we're gonna look at is the bass. Very fuzzy, very distorted. I feel like a lot of Phineas's sound design choices on this record, they're very 90s garage rock based or early 2000s. And one of the first things that stood out to me with this sound was just how dark it was. Normally when you have distorted basses, you want to bring out some of the high end to sort of balance it out. But now with this one, it's very dark, which I think is a vibe. In terms of what we're playing, the song is in C and we're just kind of doing octaves with like a slide up to that upper octave note from the seventh. And you can just see here how sparse it is compared to what it's playing in the chorus. So in the beginning section, we're just playing the sparse riff. And then it goes full punk bass during the chorus. We'll talk about the chord progression later, but I think one of the main things that gives this bass its attitude is just how distorted it is and how sort of melancholy the chords are because it's really adding this beefy layer underneath the chords that are being played. For the tone, I found this dirt bass preset and modded it a bit in Guitar Rig 6. This Supercharger GT I had to mess around with a lot. I need to mess around with this module in Guitar Rig a lot more because this one is really nice. And then a little bit of shaping with some EQ and some bass shift. Moving on to the drums, which are gigantic. Going into the chorus. The drum beat has this very fun kick pattern where it's doing a kick hit on every eighth note. This is a beat that's like really fun to do with faster indie beats because it really has this sort of driving power and you're normally not burying the beater when you're doing a beat like this you're normally doing it a bit softer just because you can't hit your kick all the way down the same way you would with this beat over here just because you need to lift your leg to move to the next hit but i think another thing that really makes the transition between these two sections fit well together is how the hit for the chorus actually comes on the and of the four so if we're counting it one and two and three and four and and you'll hear the downbeat for it is not on the one of the chorus, it's on the and. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and. And all the other elements are also hitting on the and of four and it just sort of has this fun punk rocky vibe. I wouldn't be surprised if he wrote it on an acoustic and then just hit that first chord on an upstroke. But this sort of blurring of the line also makes it really cool when he goes into the beat that he plays in the chorus which is that stomping eighth note kick beat that I was talking about. But instead of using something like the hi-hat with our power hand, we're using the low tom. And then he does this double-handed crash, moving his power hand to the ride. In the original recording, they layer up this ride section with some clap samples and some tambourine, which really makes it feel like it's coming alive. It's really hard to hear because the mix is so distorted, but if you pay attention to it, you'll hear this. And then it dies down. Comes back. And because that kick drum is consistent through all of it, and the snare is consistent through all of it, it feels sort of like an A and B section of a chorus. And that also fits really well with the chords that they're playing. So real quick, let's just look at the chords. We're in the key of C. So for the chorus, we're doing a G to an E7. 
to an A minor, walking down the G, back to the F. And so when we're listening to this chord progression, that E7 is a really spicy chord. And since we're in the key of C, that E is actually the third. And when you're playing a seven chord on the third and you're playing it as a dominant seven like this, it naturally wants to go up and resolve to the minor six. And so that resolution of the chord happens when we change up the drums. So here, if I just play the bass, the drums, and these keys real quick, just so you can hear it. The tension of this one record is released not just by playing the minor, but also changing up the drum beat, which is a really fun arrangement idea. In terms of actual drum choice, I'm using a Superior Drummer with the Rock Solid Easy X. I just chose the pieces of the kit that I thought fit best. Ended up really lowering the ambient and the ambient mono stuff just because I felt like this was more of like a 90s kit, which for anyone who doesn't know, one of the staples of 90s drums is they were just sort of coming out of the 80s where everything had a bunch of reverb on it. And so for the 90s, you tend to find that there's a lot of really dry, almost no reverb at all on the drums. These still have a bit of reverb on them because it's a bad habit of mine, but normally these are completely dry. For the keys layers, we have two very interesting textures. The first one is this Omni chord. For anyone who doesn't know, the Omni chord is this guy. It's a very old, almost toy, but a lot of producers actually love it in their studio. They've made their own instrument version of it here natively in Ableton, and you have all these controls. And this guy is sort of acting as like a higher pad. I just felt like in the original song, it was acting more chordally. Something some of you might notice is that I said that the chord progression was a G, E7, A minor, and there's no E here on the second chord. So what I've done here is I've taken an E7 chord, and I've just gotten rid of the bottom note, making the top a G sharp diminished. I knew that I didn't need that low E because it was already going to be present in things like the bass and the guitars. So when you're going through all of your MIDI, be aware that some of your other instruments might be able to project the chord information for the arrangement and you don't necessarily need to have every single instrument playing the full chord. Underneath that, I have a Mellotron. This is the Mellotron 5 from Arturia. I use this guy pretty much all the time. Whenever I need a Mellotron, it's annoying because I know there's a bunch of really good sounds in here, but I just keep it on the default Strawberry Flute preset because it just it's the classic Mellotron sound. These guys are kind of buried in the mix, but they add that sort of textural mid-range. And on the end of certain tails in the original song, you can actually hear them die out because they have a bit of a longer release. So the rest of this track are guitars. So let me dive into the different kinds. First one we have are these clean guys. I used my Strat for all of these guys because I felt like it was very 2 -B. But this is during the verse section, and these guys are kind of keeping time, adding these sort of layers on the side. But then this guy is also doing sort of a roll into the chord that they're playing with the acoustic. So if I actually play the acoustic with it, you can hear. Like it just kind of rolls into the chord. But yeah, pan to these guys a little bit just to sort of have them spread out a little bit. I use Archetype Cory Wong for this. I use the DI Shimmer preset because it has a really nice sort of single coil strap processing sound to it. And then I turned off the reverbs and I think I changed the amp sound a bit. After that, I really cut off a lot of the high end because with this 90s style mix, I didn't want it to be super high end crispy. It's really destroyed. And so I had to make sure I wasn't letting all of this like really high annoying frequencies into the mix. After that, we have our acoustic. Like I said, for the beginning is just playing that rolled pattern that the Strat is playing. Panned a little bit to the right just because I thought that that's what they did in the original. And then for the chorus, it goes full strum. I feel like Phineas does really big, round, almost cowboy chords, I want to say, 
with his acoustics on his songs. And I also love how it's kind of quiet in the mix. It's just meant to sort of get that jangle when you're playing the chorus. You'll see what I'm talking about when I play the full beat, but it's less of a chordal thing, even though it's playing chords, but it's more for that like high end excitement and just that chun, 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 and just have that percussive element on the side a bit, almost like another shaker. For tracking this, I used my Yamaha acoustic with my AKG P117. I've gone back to it and it just has the perfect acoustic guitar sound for me and all the things that I'm doing. I just recently got an Antelope interface. And one thing I love when I'm tracking acoustic is adding this filter EQ while I'm tracking. So it's kind of like having a high pass filter on a preamp. After that, just did some basic R comp and then some shaping with some regular Ableton EQ. I recorded it quietly only because, uh, somebody in my house was vacuuming at the time and I didn't want you guys to hear that. And now the last layer, which is really fun, are all of these sort of Jack White-esque electric layers. So there were several key elements that I wanted to focus in on from the original song. The one was this sort of wobbly guy that came in during the verse. It was more like a Leslie speaker sound than the original track, but I thought it was fun. Just used a really high gain setting on a really fuzzy pedal. And for this track, I really felt like using fuzz as opposed to distortion because I felt like a majority of the track, it didn't have this sort of modern edge to it. And when you want a distorted guitar sound, that has a bit more of a vintage vibe to it. Fuzz can really help with that, depending on the tone that you're looking for. And then when we get to the actual chorus, we have these two lead lines sort of battling each other. They're sort of adding this busyness on the sides. And a majority of the distorted guitar sound actually is coming from these guys. The main rhythms are actually pretty quiet in the mix. But what we've done is we've taken these two amp sounds and have panned them left and right. And one of them is just playing straight root the whole time, sort of keeping that chuggy motion going with the drums. And then up here, we have a guy who's kind of doing a solo. And it has a really distorted, like boss DS1 distortion tone where I basically just took the rotary thing off and just drove the fuzz a bit. And because these two are texturally different, when you pan them left to right and you balance them out in the volume, they feel like they fit together. And they just add a lot of sort of harmonic intrigue to the sides. And then the last layer we have are these guys, which are the main electrics. You can tell I wanted them to be really muffled. So I started with this crazy wah fuzz preset in Cory Wong archetype. And then I turned off the wah and then messed around with some amp settings and the overdrive that was on it. And I really wanted this sort of like muffled fuzzy blanket sound because these guys really aren't meant to be super audible in the mix. They're meant to be more of an accent layer or a filler layer, I guess, to the pattern that the drums are playing, that the bass is playing, that some of the guitars are playing the acoustic is playing. So it's just kind of filling that out in the low mid range. And then for the mix, this is probably what I think would be the most important if you're trying to replicate this sound is running your mix into a tube saturation or tape saturation plugin to really get that super overdrivey sound. The main thing you're gonna have to look at is your drums because the low end of these guys is gonna be interfering a lot with that tape distortion. So the way that I prefer to do this is to control your low end in your mix, run it into your tape saturation, use a little bit of multiband compression after it to sort of balance out any like low end or mid range pumping that that's going to add. And then after that, we're going to high pass it because we don't actually want those low frequencies to be in the final mix, but we want them to be triggering our tape saturation. I know it's weird. Like here, if I just solo the drums and I take it off, Versus when I turn it on. But you will probably understand it better if I show it to you in the mix, which we are at that point in the video. So let me show you what everything sounds like together.
that's what everything sounds like together. If you guys enjoyed this video, please hit subscribe, hit the bell icon, all that stuff below. Again, I do one of these videos every Friday, so if you enjoyed this, I would really appreciate it. Also, leave any comments down below of other indie pop songs or just weird pop songs that you would want me to recreate on this channel. But yeah, I will see you guys next week.